time and again I have the experience of having to follow musical performances and uh, with the kind of urkraft and uh, primal inspiration of music uh, and the performances that we've heard words seem like very clumsy instruments to be dealing with still that's uh, what God called me to do <coughs> the great English man of letters uh, Thomas Carlyle is known among other things for his view that history is created and given its course by great men in his work on heroes hero worship and the heroic in history he wrote universal history the history of what man has accomplished in this world is at bottom the history of the great men who have worked here they were the leaders of men these great ones the modelers patterns and in a wide sense creators of whatsoever the general mass of men contrived to do or to attain all things that we see standing accomplished in the world are properly the outer material result the practical realization and embodiment of thoughts that dwelt in the great men sent into the world <clears throat> among these great men Carlyle numbered Martin Luther and Luther was indeed such by the tumult and the terror and the liberation of his own inner experience of getting a gracious God Martin Luther created an agenda for his contemporaries and their descendants everyone had to follow that agenda after Luther's appearance at the Imperial Diet at Worms in 1521 Erasmus the most famous and erudite writer and publisher of the time had to challenge Luther's single-minded claim that the human will was in chains and many others did likewise including several Anabaptists except for Luther I doubt very much that Erasmus would have written his book the free will the Emperor Charles V spent his life from 1521 to 1555 struggling with what Luther had unloaded upon Europe and finally he retired in defeat having given up hope of being able to correct it the Council of Trent which began its sessions in 1546 the year of Luther's death conducted its work under the brooding presence of Luther's ghost the decrees on scripture and tradition on justification the human will and on the sacraments clearly reveal that the fathers of that council were, were dealing with the agenda that Luther had thrown to the church Carlyle was right Luther was a giant he changed the face of Europe a process that even Emperor and Pope could not arrest <clears throat> he changed the complexion of Western Christianity forever calling Luther a great man or a hero to use Carlyle's word has nothing to do with hero worship or with adulation or even with liking the man or with a positive evaluation of his theology it is to recognize that he posed the basic questions about God and ourselves and sin and salvation with such force and eloquence that even today one ignores him 
to one's own loss. Two recent biographies have been written of Luther in, in the last decade. One by Richard Marius, who regards himself as an unbeliever. And one by a German Marxist historian. Both of whom have no involvement in the issues that Luther him, that himself, that Luther raised. Both felt it was necessary to write a book about this man. Before we go on to talk about Anabaptists, we, we do need to look at what happened to Martin Luther, precisely in order to understand why Anabaptists spoke as they did on the subject of the new creation and ethics, or to use the older biblical words, faith and works. We have to do this because this was the agenda that Luther set for his contemporaries. In his 1974 biography of Luther, Richard Marius described the basic elements of late medieval theology and worldview which Luther shared with his contemporaries. The first was the belief that God was enveloped, hidden, in awesome and terrible mystery, totally inaccessible to human reasoning. God acted without reference to the approval of human understanding. He commanded, rewarded, and punished in mysterious inscrutability. One could not know how God worked. His actions could not be correlated with notions of human justice. And therefore the question of how to believe that God was gracious when he appeared to be so arbitrary lay like a leaden weight on the monk Martin Luther. Naturally, the question of what one could do in that situation would be uppermost to the searcher. The church, through its theologians, had given an answer. And it went something like this. The justification of the sinner involves cooperation between the sinner and God. And it was expressed in the doctrine of facere quod in se est. That is to say, to do the very best one can. When a person does the very best that is possible, God will then certainly add his grace to that effort and set the sinner free from the bonds of sin. The required standard for doing one's very best was the love of God for God's sake only. This doctrine kept the scrupulous person suspended permanently between hope and fear. One could only hope that one had done one's very best, but there was no way of being certain. Especially because loving God unselfishly and without reservation was, in all honesty, an unattainable standard. And thus, if one had not done one's very best, then God's grace, on which everything ultimately depended, would not be given. This it was that was Luther's dilemma as a monk in search of the perfection to which Jesus had called him in the words to the rich young man. Theologians like Gabriel Beale, who was one of Luther's teachers, believed that the very uncertainty would motivate a person toward doing his best. And it certainly had that effect on Martin Luther. But it ultimately produced not trust in God, but despair that God could never be gracious to him inasmuch as he could never love God for himself alone. <clears throat> 
He could never love for himself a God who placed him in such a cruel dilemma. A classic catch-22 in which you are damned if you do and damned if you don't. Now not everybody was as exercised about this as Luther was. If you didn't think too much about it, you could muddle through. And most people did. But it cast Luther into the slough of despond, into which the more he struggled, the farther he sank. But he did get out. Because he tells us that his attention had focused on Romans chapter 1 verse 17 and the words, the righteousness of God, which he took to mean, he says, that justice according to which God punishes sinners. Much later he wrote, day and night I tried to meditate on the significance of these words. The righteousness of God is revealed in it as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And then finally God had mercy on me and I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that gift of God by which a righteous man lives, namely faith. And now I felt as though I had been reborn altogether and entered paradise. <clears throat> it was this experience <clears throat> that gave rise to the other rallying cry of the Reformation, sola fide, by faith alone. See to it, wrote Luther in the preface to his translation of the New Testament. See to it, therefore, that you do not make a Moses out of Christ, or a book of laws and doctrines out of the Gospel. For the gospel does not expressly demand works of our own by which we become righteous and are saved. Indeed, it condemns such works. Rather, the gospel demands faith in Christ, that he has overcome for us sin, death, and hell, and thus gives us righteousness, life, and salvation, not through our works, but through his own works, death and suffering, in order that we may avail ourselves of his death and victory as though we had done it ourselves. And to our ears today, that all sounds pretty tame and commonplace. But it was the most radical theological reductionism of the 16th century. The essence of Christian faith reduced to two words, by faith alone, sola fide. This was much more radical and thoroughgoing than anything proposed by the so-called radical Anabaptists. It eliminated any human participation in salvation. Gone for good was any notion of doing one's best. <clears throat> It was like the surprise and the unexpectedness of the acquittal of a manifestly guilty criminal. The judge who should have condemned him and who knew him to be guilty acquitted him and pronounced him a just man and sent him out of the courtroom a free man. His crime no longer reckoned against him. There were no conditions. He did not have to promise to be good nor to make restitution. All he had to do was to accept the verdict and walk away and the threat of punishment or execution no longer looming over him. He had experienced a sudden and absolute change of status before God. But all the time after that, he still remained a sinner. Still, even as a sinner, he will express his joy and his gratitude in henceforth doing what is pleasing to God. A person once set free from, con from condemnation cannot but respond with good works. If faith is there, he wrote, he cannot hold back. He proves himself, breaks out into good works, confesses and teaches this gospel before the people and stakes his life on it. <clears throat> 
Everything that he lives and does is directed to his neighbor's profit in order to help him. Seeing that Christ has done this for him, he thus follows Christ's example. For where works and love do not break forth, their faith is not right. This then was Luther's message. It was spread abroad by his many books and pamphlets, by his supporters among the clergy, and also by his many students after they left his classroom at the University of Wittenberg. What the impact of his central theological message, justification by grace through faith, was on ordinary illiterate people is very difficult to determine. His attack on the papal church with its many wealthy indulgent clergy, upon the monks and nuns for a superficial and legalistic life which had no purpose, and upon the Italian Pope and his lackeys for mulcting the Germans of their hard-earned guilders, this was enormously popular in the German lands and cities. On the other hand, there were a great many who could not follow Luther's theological argument about faith and works. They understood him to be saying that God meant everyone to be free of all restrictions, social, economic, and religious, and that God freely forgives all sinners without requiring any action or good work. Added to that was Luther's insistence that a Christian, even after forgiveness had been accepted, remained a sinner all his life. All of that, quite contrary to Luther's intentions, produced a witch's brew of misperceptions to the effect that people could do whatever they pleased and still be good Christians. Two movements of people responded with considerable thought and deliberation to Luther's message. The first was the great peasant movement which began its public resistance in September 1524 and by the time it was suppressed several years later suffered at least 100,000 casualties. When the peasant leaders heard Luther's words about the freedom of the Christian they took that freedom to include liberation not only from the rules and demands of the papal church, but also from the increasing economic burdens placed on them by their feudal masters. The language of the Twelve Articles of the Peasants from early 1525 was the language of the Reformation. The defenders of the papal church are called anti-Christians in true Lutheran style. The peasants call for the right to choose their own pastors who would, quote, preach the holy gospel purely and clearly without any human addition, doctrine, or commandment, for only through true faith can we come to God, and only through his mercy can we be saved. All words that had been used by Luther. The peasants were careful to ground all their demands firmly in Scripture as the only authority with all the references in the margin of the document. The peasants had also appealed directly to Luther to support their cause, evidence that they believed that he, that they represented his views. In this, as it turned out, they were wrong. Instead of a friend and mentor, they found in him an implacable enemy. The second movement that responded with thought to Luther was Anabaptism, which came into being before the peasant movement had run its course, and which shared many common concerns with the peasants. As already described in the earlier lecture, Anabaptists were in several important respects the 16th century representatives of popular anti-clericalism. For their concern was not only for a restoration of true theology, they were also concerned for a moral restoration. <laughs> 
They complained that the new gospel, that is the gospel preached by Luther, had brought no improvement of life. People who call themselves evangelical Christians and who claim to have the faith that saves seem to continue without concern to indulge in all the common vices. Let Menno Simons express the sentiment that one finds articulated by all stripes of Anabaptists. For with this same doctrine they have led the reckless and ignorant people, great and small, city dweller and cottager alike, into such a fruitless, unregenerate life, and have given them such free reign that one would scarcely find such an ungodly and abominable life among Turks and Tartars as among these people. Their open deeds bear testimony for the abundant eating and drinking, the excessive pomp and splendor, the fornicating, lying, cheating, cursing, the swearing by the wounds of the Lord, by the sacraments and the sufferings of our Lord, the shedding of blood, the fightings, etc., which are found among many of them have neither measure nor bounds. Preacher and disciple are as alike as two peas in a pod in regard to many carnal deeds. That was written in 1541, but already 17 years earlier, in 1524, Thomas Münzer had written similar things in his protestation. And Conrad Grable and his friends in Zurich expressed their approval of what he had written about faith in their letter to him of that same year. And I'll have a good occasion to speak about that letter at some length tomorrow. Münzer was one of the links between late medieval piety and the Anabaptists. And one of the strains of that piety in the earlier centuries was a pervasive and often violent denunciation of the many sins of the clergy from the parish priest up to the Pope. The old Donatist question as to whether a vice-laden priest could be a channel of God's grace in the sacraments was one of the recurring themes. It was the question about the relationship between moral probity and sacramental efficacy, between deeds that denied the gospel and words that affirmed it, between works and faith. Officially, the church had since the fourth century decreed that the priest's sacramental effectiveness was independent of his moral performance. And the Protestant reformers retained that view. But ordinary people were suspicious of the official view because it seemed somehow a contradiction of words of Jesus like, by their fruits you shall know them. Or, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. How could a morally unclean priest be a reliable spiritual guide? If he could not embody the gospel in his own life, how could his interpretation of it be reliable? Besides, the official doctrine appeared to be self-serving. It was an example of what we today would call conflict of interest. For ordinary people, the intricacies of official orthodox theologies, which had their home in the textbooks in the universities, were less important as a mark of a true Christian than a person's day-to-day -day behavior. It seemed logic absolute that a priest who seduced the wives of his parishioners and was a drunkard was not loyal to Christ regardless of the orthodoxy of his theology. This was one of the main reasons for the demand of the peasants that they be allowed to choose and appoint as well as dismiss their priests. Anabaptists attacked the venality of the papal and evangelical clergy because they differed from both in their understanding of the relationship of faith and works. And I want now to attempt yet again to describe that understanding. <clears throat>
George Hunston Williams has drawn attention to the fact that Anabaptists used the words justification and sanctification only rarely. Although they were pressed into the great debate by Luther's sola fide, they could not simply accept his either or for reasons I've already pointed to. For Anabaptists always interpreted justification in terms of sanctification. Hence other words were found in scripture which more adequately described what they believed and experienced. It was their understanding of the relationship of faith and works which appears to me to unite all brands of Anabaptists. When therefore I move freely now between different brands of Anabaptism, I do it not because I have assembled on a, on a string text that sounds similar, but rather because they are. Anabaptists <clears throat> joined the Reformation chorus in praise of the free grace of God by which they had been forgiven and restored to God. God had intervened in the world by sending Jesus his son to die in the place of sinners, thus providing a liberation that was valid for all of humanity for all time. Human beings had no part in this divine initiative. It is grace, and will be grace to all eternity, wrote Menno Simons. But once the gospel of salvation is preached, and it is heard, a human response is required. And it is at this point that the problems arose. Balthasar Hoopmeyer, perhaps the only Anabaptist leader specifically trained in theology, wrote in 1528 that faith alone and by itself is not sufficient for salvation. Faith by itself alone is not worthy to be called faith, for there can be no true faith without works of love. Since faith by itself is not sufficient for salvation, good works must be added to faith. <clears throat> now it could be argued that since those words appear in Hubmeyer's last work, which was a justification addressed to the fervently Catholic King Ferdinand I and his theologians shortly before his execution in 1528, that because they were this, they were a compromise adapted to their understanding in the hope that he might be released. But I don't think so. Hubmeyer did not change course for fear of death, for in his earliest Anabaptist writings, he, clo he already closely ties faith in God's mercy with the works of mercy which God expects of the believer. Not only that, but there is at least an echo of the scholastic doctrine of doing the very best one can when Hubmeyer wrote, the physician, that is Jesus, helps, advises, and promotes whatever the wounded man cannot do in his own strength so that he can follow his word and commandment. From early Swiss Anabaptism comes the message that there can be no true faith without works. How has Christ worked satisfaction for our sins? Answer. Not alone for our own, but for the sins of the whole world, in so far as that world believes in him and follows after him according to the requirements of faith. In 1527, Hans Denk and Ludwig Hetzer had converted the Lutheran preacher Jakob Kautz in Worms to their point of view. In a series of seven articles for public debate which appeared over Kautz's name, he included the following. Jesus of Nazareth has not suffered for us or made satisfaction for us in any way unless we stand in his footsteps, walk the way he blazed before us, 
and follow the commandment of the Father as the Son, everyone in his measure. Even as the external eating of the forbidden fruit by Adam harmed neither him nor his descendants if the inner acceptance had not been there, so also the physical suffering of Jesus Christ is not the true satisfaction and atonement toward the Father without inner obedience and the greatest pleasure to obey the eternal will of God. From the father of Anabaptism in the Netherlands, Melchior Hoffmann, comes the same refrain. For the whole world cries, Believe, believe, grace, grace, Christ Jesus. And therefore it does not choose the better part, for its hope is idle and a great deception. For such belief cannot justify them at all before God, as the holy apostle James writes. Therefore faith cannot make one justified if it does not bring in therewith his fruits. Many other statements like those just quoted could be added, enough to fill many pages from all stripes of Anabaptists. One more will therefore do to establish this point. Menno Simons, writing in perhaps 1537, said, He will not save you nor forgive your sins, except according to his word, namely, if you repent and if you believe, if you are born of him, if you do what he has commanded and walk as he walked. But Menno Simons experienced great frustration in trying to convince his opponents that he truly accepted justification by faith. Sometimes his frustration boiled over, as it did in his true Christian faith of 1541. Among the Lutherans, he wrote, all the vices imaginable are tolerated. They're worse in their behavior than pagans, but they still claim to be Christians. But when someone reminds them that a Christian ought to live according to the example of Christ, he must from that hour hear that he is one who believes in salvation by good works, a sectarian agitator, a hypocrite. His Lutheran opponents in particular could not be convinced because to faith Menno always added the absolute requirement of living the Christian life according to the commandments of Christ. He was well aware, Menno was, that he was trying to steer a middle course between the opposite poles of the papal church's doctrine of meritorious works and the Reformation doctrine of sola fide. But he found that anyone who tries a middle way will be hated and vilified by both sides. And indeed, Menno was only doing what the writer of the tract on the satisfaction of Christ had attempted 14 years earlier. And he wrote, Verily, blessed is he who remains on the middle path, who turns aside neither to the work righteous. He's talking now about the Catholics or the preaching works in such a way that they think no more of faith so that all their works are like wild plums that is ceremonies without faith nor to the side of the scribes and there he's talking now about the Protestants, the reformers who although they have forsaken works then turn aside to the right and teach in the name of gospel a faith without works and take the poor, obedient Christ as their satisfaction, but will not hear what he says. The major point of difficulty lies in the differing views of justification put forward by Luther and the Anabaptists. For Luther, a person who had been justified, pronounced just by God's grace, had been given a new status before God, he was just before God, but he remained at the same time totally a sinner. But Anabaptists understood the justification of the sinner to mean that he was not only pronounced just, but that he was in fact just. It was not only rechtfertigung, justification, but gerechtmachung, making just. It was not a new status that the forgiven sinner received, but a new heart 
and a new intention. And hence Anabaptists from the beginning used regeneration and other equivalent terms to describe their experience. <clears throat> Professor Fritz Blanke of the University of Zurich drew our attention to the fact that the earliest Anabaptist movement in Zollikon was an Erweckungsbewegung, a movement of religious awakening in which people were converted and launched upon an improved life. Menno Simons especially wrote constantly about regeneration. Those who are regenerated or born again are renewed in Christ and have received a new heart and spirit. Once they were earthly minded, now heavenly. Once they were carnal, now spiritual. Once they were unrighteous, now righteous. Once they were evil, now good. It is these regenerated, reborn believers that bring forth the works that God requires. The works are not a precondition for God's grace as in the earlier nominalist doctrine, but they are the visible and necessary component of the regenerate life. If works do not follow, the rebirth is not complete. One could say that such a person was not reborn, but stillborn. When God does good works in us through grace, they are just and good, wrote Jacob Hutter in one of his letters. Once God's offer of salvation has been accepted, then, there follows not simply a new status, but a new creature, created in God in true righteousness and holiness. The kind of text that we find in all Anabaptist writers. But what matters even more, what made matters even more difficult for Anabaptists in this debate was a further choice of words, which while they were biblical words, nevertheless widened and deepened the gulf between them and the Protestants, especially the Lutherans. The words were perfection and deification. They were both words that reminded Luther of the uncertainties and errors that he had left behind. The monastic quest was a quest for perfection. If you want to be perfect, said Jesus, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Poverty, chastity, and obedience were the so-called counsels of perfection. A perfection which Luther found that was not possible and which it was pure unbelief and rebellion to pursue. German mysticism of which the German theology was a deluded product and which was very influential in Anabaptist circles strove for deification Vergottung is the word. And that this is the supreme goal of the believer. For Luther, this was again nothing but idolatry and blasphemy. Both words, perfection and deification, were used to describe and identify the change that took place in the believer through the action of God's Spirit. Through faith man received a new divine nature. Man was not created in order that he should remain man on the sixth day, wrote Leonard Schemer, but in order to come to the seventh day so that he might become divine or deified and so come to God. Dirk Phillips wrote about the believer being glorified. Christ is glorified in his disciples in the same way as the Father is glorified in him. He spoke his Father's word, did his will, and finished his work. And hence his disciples also must keep his doctrine, do his will, and finish his work, that Christ may be glorified in them. This is the language of deification. And that is exactly what they meant 
The word perfection too keeps coming up. In his last letter to his sisters and brothers in the faith, Felix Mons wrote, When a person produces the right fruits of repentance, the heaven of eternal joy is purchased and secured for him by grace through Christ, through his innocently shed blood, which he gladly shed. And thereby he shows us his love and gives to us the power of his spirit. And whoever receives the same and practices it will grow and become perfect in God. Other terms also were used, such as being cleansed of all things, manifesting Christ's nature and spirit, conforming in all things to the word and ordinances of the Lord, or the constant reference to those who better themselves. Valerius, schoolmaster who died a martyr's death in 1568, stated that while Christ had called his disciples to perfection, they still had many defects, and he said, we are sorry that we are not perfect. His whole statement, however, is counterbalanced as so often in Anabaptist writings by strong assertions that a person is saved by God's grace alone and not by works. Again, Menno Simons admitted that in him righteousness and unrighteousness were mixed. But he would not admit that a man remained a total sinner even after justification. What shall we all these centuries later say to these things? First of all, there are some things we may not do. We may not charge Anabaptists with shallow theological thinking, even if most of them were not trained theologians. If they had little acquaintance with the standard texts on theology, they had an astonishingly broad acquaintance with the Bible. The charges often made against them that in the made against them in the past that they did not understand the Bible correctly and used it improperly are confessional judgments and therefore relative. Anabaptists desperately attempted to understand and convey what they took to be the overall message of the scriptures. If they got into difficulties doing it, the problem was at least in part the nature of the Bible itself. And that was a problem for Zwingli and Luther as well. Second, we may not trivialize the issue here discussed and dismiss it as a matter of semantics. To argue as they did that creeds had to be completed by deeds in order to qualify as Christian was a dangerous thing to argue. Because there were sanctions against disagreeing with the Pope and with Zwingli and with Luther. They could have chosen safer words, but they chose biblical ones because they regarded that choice as being part of faithfulness to Christ. And third, we may not, as their religious opponents all around did, dismiss them as hypocrites because they attempted to fulfill the law of Christ and in doing so forswore the common vices of the crowd and appeared to indulge in moralistic nitpicking which is so offensive to our modern liberal sensibilities. They were, as I attempted to show in the last lecture, the 16th century carriers of a dissenting strain in Christianity that had very little patience with theologies adjusted to human idleness and with institutional rationalizations for not following the Christ of the Gospels. They reminded their contemporaries not to make Jesus ineffective by banning him and his teaching to the realms of theological abstraction, but to take him seriously as a teacher and a leader along with trusting him as Savior. Still, I believe we have not always been honest in evaluating our tradition on this question. As with all other Christian traditions, it is a position fraught with difficulties and pitfalls.
Anabaptists deliberately chose their particular path. And the fact that many Christians from outside our tradition today celebrate their vision and agree with it does nothing to remove the problems which attend it. At the heart is the tension between how we wait on the one hand what God does for us in salvation and on the other hand our own role in it. The retention of infant baptism by the reformers symbolized their release from this tension. Despite the principle of sola fide Infant baptism, especially for Martin Luther, infant baptism was a sign that there is no human participation in divine salvation at all. The revival of the baptism of believers only in Anabaptism under, I'm sorry, the revival of, of the baptism of believers only in Anabaptism underscores their belief that there is a human participation. There is something superficial about the Mennonite claim that since Anabaptists always denied that they were perfect, they were not perfectionist. I have shown that they denied being perfect, but also that they unambiguously claimed to be on the way to perfection. Their own statements prove that the charges of perfectionism of their opponents were not without foundation. Now, perfectionism does not constitute a claim to sinlessness, and I think this is where the confusions often come in. It identifies a concern or a preoccupation with moral perfection. I remind you that Jesus himself used these terms. Therefore, you must be perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. And once justification, getting right with God, includes behavior, concern with perfection inevitably sets in. If we believe that we are sanctified, changed inwardly into godliness, into godlikeness, the question of how far we have moved on the scale haunts us. How sanctified am I? Am I nearly perfect? Mennonite historians and theologians have often correctly insisted that the Lutheran position was very vulnerable to antinomianism, that is, to a life without law. Luther himself always denied that sola fide, when properly understood, led to ethical carelessness. But he also admitted his dismay that there was so little improvement in life among his own people. On the other hand, Anabaptists themselves knew the dangers of their emphasis on ethical behavior. Menno and Sattler and Marpeck all saw and acknowledged the danger of legalism. We today need to admit that. While all denied being saved by works, Perfectionism was and is implicit wherever there is emphasis on ethical behavior as part of divine justification. Or where, whenever justification becomes sanctification. The argument has frequently been made that the institution of church discipline in Anabaptism constituted a denial of perfectionism. I remind you that it could just as easily be seen as a device of the church to promote the greatest degree of perfection possible in the Christian life. Indeed, so far as I can understand our history, that has always been its function. Nevertheless, for all the hazards, I believe that Anabaptists were right in their emphasis on ethics, on following Jesus, as an integral part of being a Christian and broad Christian conviction in our century both Catholic and Protestant supports that judgment. But the perils are real and they will not go away. 
North American Mennonites are particularly vulnerable at this point. Schalke Folstra, the Mennonite theologian at the University of Amsterdam, has recently written, The radical peace testimony which we hear in our time betrays its Anabaptist signature in its perfectionist tendency, both in its churchly and its secularized form. The secular peace movement is split into as many splinters as the Mennonite community ever was, and for precisely the same reasons. Both the churchly and the secular movement are plagued by self-righteousness and a judgmental attitude toward outsiders. But that is no reason for abandoning the Anabaptist tradition or the peace movement. It just means that we must listen to the outsiders and together with them seek new ways of articulating our faith in God who saves us by his grace alone and to listen to what in our time he requires of us.